Thank you very much, Anna Silvia. Welcome and welcome to this webinar on genetic and oceanographic studies in fish spawning aggregation sites of the Mesoamerican Reef. Thank you for being with us today. This webinar is a cooperation between Community and Diversity COBE, ECOSUR, and the Technological um, Institute of Technomar and the Ecomar Fish. During the event, and with the participation of the experts that will accompany us today in the panel, we're going to listen to about new technolo technologies of how to study the aggregations of fish. We're also going to learn about how to apply oceanographic studies to, in the spawning sites. We're going to see uh, the Blanquisal in Mexico uh, history, and we will listen to the history of a fisher, Don Mencho, and Ana Selvia will present each panelist in turn. You will have 15 minutes for your interventions, and at the end, we will open a space for questions and answers. I'm very happy to start the webinar, and I ask Ana Silvia Martinez now to please make a brief presentation on Marfish Project. Thank you very much, Maria Jose. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very pleased to present the Marfish from Marfand Fish on monitoring and protection of spawning and aggregation reef fish of the Mesoamerican system. The general objective of this project is to promote the recovery of fisheries by strengthening the protection of commercial fish PRAs as critical areas <clears throat> for the life cycle of species by improving knowledge and understanding of aggregations in the region. This is the newest and most in the largest network of coordinated monitoring in the MAR. Our donors at the moment are French Fund for Environmental Global, FFEM, the Summit Foundation, Maricia Foundation Oceans Fund, and MAR Fund through its small program, small grants program and Belize Marine Fund. The implementation of the project <clears throat> is carried out with the participation of eight central partners of our community and biodiversity government. Coral Reef Alliance, Coral. Talking in English already about the different titles in English. And we have nine site selections have been for the Marfish project, which as you can see on the map, those are two in Mexico. There are, say, we have three in Belize. And she's mentioned who the person is. And she's saying who they are. In, who, who is in charge of each one. And in Guatemala, and he says who, and in Honduras, we have three sites according, to, and there of coral. There are Western Banks, Carl, Cordelia Banks, and Sandy Bay. And I'm going to present to you the, the, the different sponsors for this. So we're going to 
have the regional workshop to match data of common monitoring strategy. This, okay, this was had 27 participants in four countries, professional managers and members and researchers and uh, community leaders were present as well. And a result of this, we standardized the methodologies with the visual underwater sensors, the uh, CVS sensors with laser and acoustic sensors. And also we had a, a data to, to so regarding monitoring in Marfish, for example, we have to monitor eight at Punta Allen, Mexico, Gladenspit, uh, in MLA, Cayman Crown, Belize in Guatemala, San, and Sandy Bay, Cordelia, and Texas in Honduras. The ERPs have been observed directly and indirectly and uh, they've done directly or indirectly according to the five species of groupers and two of, of snappers other species such as uh, also as uh, such as mackerel atlantic spade fish and oceans uh, trigger fish as well we have also found in different we have gone She's mentioned again the species, mackerel, Atlantic spade fish, and the ocean trigger fish. As a result of the, we have also had a first, uh, a first status report of the ARPs in the Mar region. This was also revised by Kobe in 2020. It's the first report of, of, the, of the Mar uh, spawning, we were able to be able to uh, do it in thirty six sites, eight in Mexico, sixteen in Belize, one in Guatemala, and eleven in Honduras. Or and also, we have also uh, be able to get into the protected areas, and we were able to have many of the uh, people that involved. And as a result of this, we have find that 94% of these aggregated sites are only 22 are in non-known Finnish fishing zones and, and 24 have been visually verified of those. Uh, other documents that are produced are the the characterization of the use of the resources of the Corona Cayman Reef through information based on user communities. And it was done by Carlos, ben, uh, Carlos Perez in 2020. And this is also, this is the first diagnosis. Diagnosis is done on the methods of the area. And this was done with interviews to the fishers at uh, both the uh, the um, artisanal and the uh, sports fishermen of the fishers communities. All these community, all these is available on our web page as the Marfish project. We also found the uh, policy recommendations of fish reproductive aggregations, and it was done by uh, Ida, Kobe, and Marfun in 2020. This a document of policy reproductions are conservations of uh, reproductive aggregations and how an effective management can recover the population of fish in the Mar region. We also have recommendations from given by the experts of the four countries for the different actors and the interesting parties of the regions. The vision of the doc of this document is to create and unify the vision of how we see things in the Mar region. And also, um, 
Healthy Reef Initiative is also re re reproduced since 2011 of uh, the the health reports of the Mesoamerican Reef. And this 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 document that was um, that was produced in 2020, we find we've we've included the reproductive aggregations and the evaluations of the the reef health. And you can find this on page 20 of their report. And we also have the protection and monitoring of the, the Tide in Belize, Fundejo in, in uh, Healthy Reef Initiative in Guatemala, the uh, reefs and protected ones in Belize and Guatemala is also the characterization of the of the uh, uh, aggregates. We also take a active initial management activities. We also take care of a scientific investigation. Uh, so given the support for the effective management and monitoring of this for the uh, the, these are, um, are these are supporting scientific such as reef health monitoring, mapping, biological creations, and we also had a workshop for the for the fishing sector of the countries of the Gulf of the uh, Honduras. This workshop was focused on the fishers themselves to be able to give them the information and also have a put together a committee of fishers to be able to have a, a proposal to have a joint proposal for for all the whole area so that's so far for my from my i have that's what i have to present thank you very much if you have questions and i will pass on the microphone to to alejandro medina who's the Department of the Engineering of Biochemical of, of the Chetumal Technological University. And he's, he'll be giving us a Blanquizal history. And I'll go to Alejandro and I'll share your screen now. find it. Hmm. Ponencia dos. Ponencia dos. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to find You're it. You're in desktop. Yeah. Bloody hell. Okay. Yes, I am. It's a pleasure for me to be in this meeting where we're talking about the history and characteristics of the Blanquisal spawning site. If we have been working with Ecosol for many years, and I have, uh, I'm going to present a few of the results that we have had. And I'm going to um, explain to you that part of the, in this research has to do with the history of all the many people, the history of many people, many fishers, and their history is very important. And there's one man that we have learned a lot from him. And um, we will be presenting his history here today too. We can see that the reproductive aggravations of fish are key events in the life of the fish. They concentrate all their reproductive effort in just a few days of the year where they reproduce, certain days of the year. Next, please. What have we done with the history of the aggregation sites? Well, there have been several um, works in the south of Quintana Roo, and we have been able to make an analysis to learn about the history 
of these sites. Between 1955 and 1990, four sites have been studied. Two of them were two species of grouper arise, Carranza, 19, Solis, prepared these reports. These are people that came and would work along the coast for many years and prepare these reports. Then in 1991, there were 10 sites. We started to get to know more sites. There were two species of grouper that used to appear there. And there was certain, a lot of visual uh, docu documentations were being able to be prepared. And this was also based on the cooperation of the fishers. Uh, we used to, we started to work with the height, sex, the weight. And 1991, Sosa Cordero and Aguilar Pereira, Aguilar Davila. And in 1996, Sosa Cordero and Cárdenas Vidal were working on these sites. These sites that I'm showing you on the map, on the previous map, refer to the sites that we were uh, analyzing um, starting in 2001 in order to understand the sites that where the fish uh, would um, gather. And the per this is a preliminary um, study. Each one of these were prepared with by interviews with the fishers. And we started to find information that that in 74% of the sites, grouper would arrive, uh, would gather in this, uh, at these sites to reproduce. And there were uh, snapper, grouper, etc., and different types. The lunar snapper also. So it is really a history that we started to document. This site known as Blanquisal, we're going to be offering some results to you shortly. Next, please. This shows us the captures of 2001, the catch monitoring. We can see the different sizes too between male and female. And we could establish the rank of sizes that would come to the site. After these dates, we have been able to, we know that this is a protected natural area. And we still are lucky that we continue to have protection of this resource. In 2004 and 2005, we monitored the Blanquisal site. The days that we were working there, we found this type of behavior in the aggregation. And we started in 2004 and we finished in January 2005. And we found that the organi organisms would start to group in the site of Blanquisal. And where does this take us? As the bibliography says, these are events that appear where hundreds and thousands of organisms migrate to the site and they form large groups. There, this behavior at the beginning was to aggregate, then there were some fights, and then there were some 
changes of coloring that would appear. We could see why do they come to this Blanqui Sound site? Mainly, these are sites with very special characteristics that can be the platforms, the structure, and the time and the dates are also presented here. And we have, uh, the, the fishers informed us that with the full moon, uh, this is where we could see that five or seven days after the full moon, there uh, was more activity. So we continue with the monitoring, with monitoring and visual sense sensors. Here we can see results that we have found. We can see the Epinephalus stratus, the types of species, the Mr. Perca tigris. And here this reflects the work that was done there, how we reached this, how we were able to compile this data. during many months. The fish have a behavior where they appear at the site at certain times that are reflected here. A very important part that we have noted is that there is a, a phase where they start to appear in January, February, and March most important is in January, where we find an abundance of species. These are the results of what we have estimated in 2001 at Grouper. In 2001 and 2002, we were able to make an analysis of how many could arrive, uh, aggregate at the site, and possibly because of bad weather, there was little monitoring at certain times. December 2002, we found that there was the fishing of the, the behavior of the fishes where we, we were able to analyze. Um, and in December 2003, January 2004, there was uh, bad weather, so there was uh, little monitoring performed. Most of the time we were on the field, we had bad weather, the waves were very strong, and the day we were able to go out, we could only count that small quantity of individuals. So we're seeing here December 2004 to March 2005, where there was good weather, we were able to see an abundance of individuals. In 2012, as you see, we were able to work in January to March, and we found 1,700 individuals and 700 tigris species. January to March 2015, we found around 1,800. And here are some photographs of the aggregation. And I'm going to show you a video so you can see the results of the videos. This is the Tigris by color. And we are scuba diving and we are working at the same time. This is very small part because what we found was a great quantity of organisms. The video is about 15 minutes long. And the next video of the striatus aggregated by color. 
and returning from a larger aggregation that was away from the rocks. You can see they are moving, there's interaction between the two species. And the strat they're moving together. And we can see how the both species are moving together. And what conclusion can we come to? But the Blanquisal site is a multi-specific site. And uh, there's a density and average sizes are still maintained in an adequate state. And we are maintaining the, the density and average sizes. Small refuge area should be implemented and it's important to maintain continuous monitoring of aggregations in the future. Our refuge area is in the protected area, but it needs to also be monitored continuously. For, this has been monitored for about over 20 years. And uh, we have also, we're trying to find the opportunity to convert this into a refuge area. And in the future, we are hoping to maintain continuous monitoring of the aggregations. Why do I say this? Because in the northern part of the natural protected area, uh, is just outside the natural protected area. So it's very important to be able to maintain these grad or these great organisms. And every year, that every year appear at these sites. The next one, please. So I would like to thank you all, the fishermen from Excalac that have worked with us and the SAM project and Kobe also, who are with whom we are working together. We have been working and we have just returned from a study with them from, and in January, there is another event that will be uh, started in January and so this will be all for today. Thank you very much. In time. Muchas gracias. Ahora les voy a presentar. Thank you very much. Now, uh, thank you, Alejandro. Now we can present Lourdes Vasquez. Uh, he's a, a researcher in the barcode application of the, uh, of the Ecosur of Chetumal, and she will be presenting to us her application of the life barcode to identify early stages of the fish in the Mesoamerican reef system uh, DNA. So she is now asked to get to the microphone. So thank you very much, Lulu says, Lourdes, can you see what I've heard? Can everybody see it? Yes, just go into the complete screen. There's a button on the bottom for complete screen. There we go, all set. So I will thank the, the invitation to this webinar. You have, I, work in the in the, in the south uh, education area of ecosur particular particularly marta valdez and, and me have uh, gone into uh, fisher fishery if this is of the of larva post larva and uh, this presentation is basically on that so i work with the ECOSUR, 
and I'll start with this. As an introduction, I want to comment that there's many reasons for the uh, fish eggs and larva. Starting with the, the, one of the reasons is the biodiversity. We are a privileged area. Really, we are in the second barrier reef uh, of, the, of the world in size. So we have a large diversity of fish that we all of us really know about because of this. Yeah, we also have questions of reproduction and recruitment of uh, larva. And so it's fe feasible to be able to, to address how to know more uh, the success of reproduction and recruitment. There's a very important fishes, very large for commercial fisheries, as well as for recreation and, and sports uh, activities as well. And these fishes are very important for the ecologically important for this for this area. And understanding the reproductive and recruitment things is vital to be able to as we talk about the aggregated sites right now, they are sites that we know that there's going to be reproduction. And we know that we are interested in finding out, this, finding the species that are here, that are, that, are, that are spawning here. And these are very often to do by visual, uh, but I also do it by my sampling to be able to know what the different stages of the different fish are uh, in those very important areas. So understanding the reproduction and rec recruitment is very important to be able to, because they suffer great var var various variants in how successful or not they are, particularly in, spe in marine species, species, to be able to investigate what those uh, uh, ha what is really happening, but that's given us an enormous demand of knowledge of what, or the, but which are the most vulnerable within the cycle of, of life of the fish. And also understanding all these variations that their they're, they're reproductive successful only if we have practical and conservation uh, practices that are that are that are available to how is it complicated because you know studying um, uh, eggs of, um, of of spawning is very because uh, because we we have to, the enormous uh, challenges because we're talking about very small sizes one point point uh, of 0.5, they could be up to six millimeters in, in size. The larva fishes, we find basically 2.5 millimeters in size, upwards up to six, seven millimeters, or so some even more. But the generally, it is about 2.5 millimeters, so very small. So all that we do and we show and sample we put into alcohol because alcohol is a fixer to be able to cons conserve all the can genetic material that we after can use but it does lower us the visualization of certain characteristic that would be able to for, for example pigments can be varied so the high uh, there's there's a there's a there's a high diversity of species in tropical areas. There's a huge resemblance between different species, which also have a great similarity between one and the other when they are in the in the larva stage. But we do have a, a light at the end of the tunnel with these because we have come up with a great deal of support to the traditional methods of, of identifying these. So the emergence of molecular tools to identify it. I'm a, 
a witness to this because yes, the support to traditional market, we, we, it's virtually impossible to, to, to find fish eggs. But in 2003, Paul Lebert in Canada proposed a, a mito, mitochondrial uh, gene called, called cytochrome uh, subunit as a, as a subcomponent. Uh, as a as a genetic marker, so the the DNA nucleidic uh, arrangements is unique to, to to these species. So therefore, these these uh, if we substitute we substitute by colors, as you can see in this slide here, you can find a code a barcode that is very known to us when we go to when we do our shopping, because everything does have uh, a barcode. So in this case, to be identified, these species. And these barcodes uh, come from this, in this in the initial efforts of, of, of Paul Herbert and, and his team. So we allow us then to be able to know at the what what in, in the egg and larva or post larva area how we can recognize which the adult we have to have reference of, to the adult fish to be able to have, make this connection between egg larva and boat larva regarding the adult if we don't have the relationship it's been impossible to identify so there's a there's a genetic sequence library that there was very strong support as a as a capital uh, seed capital to be able to do so in what we call a platform called the bold system that's 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 located in canada at the guild university so we need to have this library this bold system library to be able to to be able to work with species that are so small uh, in these exemplary. So that's all I wanted to do. That's very briefly that these are the last data that we've been able to come up with to be able to put in the bold system in the platform that we talk about and the barcode system. This there's more than 13 million samples registered. That gives us uh, an estimate uh, of more than 300,000 species that have barcodes. So we've already have a, we have barcode for 300,000 species. So the, even that is little because we know as in, as in fish, as you can see with a barcode, we only have 23,406 with the barcodes. So the number of species is, is larger. So we still have the work to do, not, not as much as others, but Mexico uh, occupies a sixth place in the number of sequences, uh, genetic sequences. And on the other side of the screen, you can see that 85% of the Mexicans' uh, uh, input is on the frontier of Ecosur. So Ecosur has done a great deal as you as you can see as reflected in these numbers so you have seen of the type of, of material that we have generated several several uh, of the barcode system we have we've done sampling uh, oceanographic ones as as in the mar region is a large area but we have taken a lot of materials that is already inside the platform and also coastal sampling that you know some of you know as a, of the of the channel network and uh, we we know about about the ecome and the and the light uh, trap as though so that you know the the type of methodologies that we do and the type of work of collection that does nothing to do with the tremendous amount of work has to have gone into identifying it. So if we 
be able to proceed, we have to come up with a select the item. We have to identify traditional methods, have to capture the database. Uh, we're using the bold system for this, in the bold, in the bold system. I uh, take a photograph of the specimen. And also, obviously, we have to have, uh, have it a uh, 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 certified method to be able to do so. This is a value to be able to be able to participate in this type of thing. It has to be referenced in each one. So we can go to the species and be able to find if it's in. so on the on the lower part I look I can see the type of of tissue pickup that we phrase very because I want to just rapidly to go to the results. That is the type of genetic that we would that we do to be able to as we this is is um, of, a, of a 2d um, so we have we have to take the tissue we have to work on the, there's a method is called as a, a sanger and then we go into amplifying the dna we visualize the products we do the sequencing this is already done outside the country. We don't have the person. The first three steps we can't do it, but the, the second, the last one, the fourth one, we have to do it outside. Then we come up with the results and be able to have a have a into a, a tree of similarity, be able to try and translate that. One of the worst the, the results that we've had that it was published in 2010. One was the first one in the Atlantic where we used uh, the Marfan and other and those investigators there in Canada. The first lift of fish for the uh, Mexican Caribbean. We, we found an analysis of 1,392 specimens with of 100, we've reported 100. 136 uh, genders and 74 families. Some of the we have uh, we have notable case for the Abdul and the first we were the Latinas from Maximos of, of the Bokineta, the first time we found them. So this has been really a call to us attention because the Caribbean, the Mexicans are the the, the most um, the, re, tremendous spawning areas of this area. And they're the, they're the least registered before. So now from Point Allen and the others, we have now got these echo uh, scientific collection in the entire Pacific. So through the barcoding, we are able to identify not only was there a Maccabee, but there's also two other species, as I can see it. So, uh, so the uh, Albula vulpes is a very substantial uh, monetary value, and the uh, Gorensis, and, the, and the, another one that's called in the that's been processed as a new a new species. And those of these. Of the Maccabi larva, as you can see, if you know a little bit more about this, and the, and the scientific echo sur, we have the vouchers of each one of those collected species. And so the Caribbean, Mexican Caribbean is one of the community, communities of the large, largest recruitment within the, uh, the Caribbean. Another very important point was uh, the Ethanus. Elo Taratus, those, 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 the the larva that we know here is a is a whale shark favorite food. So we know that we have for a bonito spawning area in the northern Mexican Caribbean. That we know it is in 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 the area of Isla Mujeres, Holbox, July, in July, August, and September. So this we've done in 2009, but surely will be done every year. So that's the work we did with Marta Valdez, and, and she mentioned the person that we're doing. We also have 
Uh, we've also done a distribution of, of after identifies of larva of, uh, of, of and eggs of a sailfish and swordfish in the Caribbean for using a card phone. So the, the most we can actually, so the sailfish, it's almost impossible to find that this little larva is a, is a, a swordfish, but we were able to do so, or a, or a, or a sailfish to be able to see the, the different, it's very complicated because other, other species are also very, very, very light characters. So on the case of swordfish, it's a little easier to, to be able to recognize, but here's the maps of distribution that the species at the level of the larva stage. And you can say that very re well represented both of them, but both uh, as swordfish and sailfish. Uh, another identification of eggs was done as uh, Elva, Elva uh, Leva did this uh, in the southern Mexican Caribbean using barcodes in the south of the Caribbean, uh, Mexican Caribbean. The, she found, with analysis of uh, 143 sequences, she found 33 nominal species, 35 genes, and 24 families. And also, some of them are very important right there of the description, for example. There's also others that live in in very deep an area, but for we've just for practical the 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 type of fish that is important: the horse mackerel, the golden, the blanco bonito, uh, these are the white marlin. This is also in the southern part of Quintana Roo. Uh, review of our projections of barcodes gave us this update that we've done very rapidly for eggs. We have 82 species, uh, 440 at larva stage and 104 at post larva. The maps below give the, the mar location of larvas and post larvas in Mar as well. The majority of those uh, post larvas are in the, in the monitoring that we're doing in our connectivity of this. There's a need to increase of uh, Guatemala and Honduras. We were concentrated, of course, in, in Belize and Mexico because of practical, logistical, of uh, being able to tra transport larva, which is not very easy. So here, as one of the results of the most of, all of our session is the fact that we've been able to come up with a map of the spawning areas of the summer species with barcodes and DNA. For example, then she's mentioning the species that's very valuable for this area. And she's also identified different ones that are in that in that in this. Some of them are known to you. Excuse me. This is a, the Regalegos negle. I put it as if large because it's one of the largest species of the word. And we have uh, eggs of these species and. Uh, uh, below, I have a list of the main species that we can now practically assure that we have the spawning areas and where, when they do it, in uh, from the north to the south, up to all of, of where we find these these things. The, the dorados, for the 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 marlin, the the. the the swordfish, the barilete, so we've, and the sturgeons, and the, the grunts as well. So we have, because the grunts, though, are some, um, uh, 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 skipjack tuna, did brown sturgeon, because we've been able to do with a student, with identify uh, the taxonomic of the, of the species of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the brown surgeon and the blue surgeons. And this is a result of very interesting that I had no way to explore it, but I'm 
I'm sharing it for the first time with you. This is a list, but there's much, much more in the way of species that can be analyzed. The conclusions then. So we must conclude, I must come to the, the, the barcode uh, life tool was successful to identify the, 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 the early stages of all, even, even into early, early was we have 90% of uh, success in be able to sequ sequence these areas, these uh, species. So it's impossible to divide fish eggs and, uh, and very early lava without support from the barcode of life. We've tried to do so the traditional ones, but we can in the future maybe construct an area of, of regs and not depend upon the genetic tool, but we have to build, we have to build many within the, within the, the build system library. So this uh, re review that has eight, 80 species been reported in the egg stage, more than 400 in larva stage in the different uh, genetic areas and more than 100 in post larva recruitment stage, which is a very important contribution to the biodiversity uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the region. Of the of the of the fishing dynamic of the so there's uh, those spawning sites and seasons are economically important species and we show for the first time uh, ten species that we see here. There's many more to go, so we it's necessary to increase the adult sequence to feed the boat system. Without adults, we can't because we're, we're, we're working on such space. So this is a great effort by the staff of Equasur researchers and students, Marta Valles and Manuel Elias have collaborated with us and students that have contributed to the knowledge of the virus of the eggs, larvae and juveniles so small that is so important for the information of the marine fish. Uh, so that's the many thanks, acknowledgements today of all the people, but particularly of Martha, of Alba, Marta Garcia, Jose Angel Holger, Don Mencho, we is our guide. Also, there's no, the directors of the staff of the, of the protected areas of Mexico, Belize, Honduras. This is very, this is the work of many, many people. Uh, uh, Paul Herbert, the Abolt system, microsystem, which started with a, with a, with a seed capital support and the captains and crew of the, of the, the of the NOAA and our, colleague Victor Baker mean so this is that for me present thank you thank you very much Lulu there was wonderful work regionally and tremendous uh, work this present the results of this presentation summarized in your presentation thank you very much and now I would like to introduce you to Jacobo Kamal. He's an implementer and monitoring uh, coordinator of, of the COVI Marine Reserves. He is going to be presenting application and usage of ADN, of DNA uh, tools. Uh, welcome, Jacobo, to this panel. Gracias. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to talk a little bit about of environmental monitoring, that as an organization, we have been working for several years and in the last couple of years, in spite of the situation, we have been able to advance quite a lot, especially in the site for fish spawning aggregations. I'll talk to you a little bit about our organization. We are a civil society organization. 
we have a work strategy in which we co-create solutions with the men and women of the coastal communities. We also uh, not only create, but we also have a network that incubates the ideas. We accelerate the solutions to connect the greatest amount of uh, men and women from the coastal communities. And something that is very important. We look for those people that can scale up and that can be an inspire, inspire other people, the fishermen and women that do this. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. A lot of this work is done with the men and women of the communities. And we also have relations with local researchers in <clears throat> local and outside the country. And this is a community job. I would also want to give you a little bit of context regarding the aggregations. That it is a site in which there is a high number of organisms of a species. In general, they are large numbers and that are very related to the characteristics of the site, the particular characteristics of the site. They like the form, they like the extension that has to do with the currents. It also has to do with the specific environmental conditions, as Alejandra mentioned in her presentation. And the main characteristic of this event is basically the reproduction of the, it, it's the purpose is reproduction. It is a reproductive aggregation. I want to talk a little bit about what we have been doing in a very specific area, which is one of the sites in this community. We have what we call the fishers who are fishing lobster mainly. And for two years, two years ago, they proposed to the Mexican uh, authorities of a refuge, fisher, a fisher refuge area where certain spe species could gather in these polygons with the aim to protect and preserve the species and to be able to recover the fishery at long term. Currently, the cooperative, the cooperative is renovating itself so that it can continue for at least five more years. The community is called Puntale, and it is known as Puntale. What have we done in these two sites? First of all, we started with the marine environmental DNA, which is basically marine water collection. At the moment in um, aggregation sites, this uh, marine water, there is fragments of genetic information of the species present there or who pass through there, or there is information that comes from far away, carried by the currents. How does this happen? with the mucosity of the body, the, the scales, the organisms themselves, and in the gametes themselves, in the process of reproduction. And also when the organisms die, they also generate organisms. So basically there are fragments of this information in the water. And this is what we try to extract when we do a sampling. In the aggregation site, we have been collecting water uh, samples in the spawning events. And this is done being done in, by two methodologies. The first with autonomous diving. And currently we are using an instrument called Niskin bottles, which helps us to accelerate the collecting process. And this allows us to collect more water samples during one day. These samples are filtered, are preserved, they are labeled to be sent to a lab where the analysis is done. 
What I'm mentioning here is a Michihavin site in Fundal. Another method that has been used, another technique is to collect DNA from particular fish individuals. This has been done at the moment with the Caribbean grouper and the Michihavin uh, site. And what we have been doing is from the cap, the, the, um, the fishes that were captured in the fishing seasons out of the fishing zone, the men and women of the community help us to collect these samples. They, take, they measure them. Um, we do not necessarily obtain a coordinate, but we do have a route where they were captured. They register the size, they collect the tissue, and the sample is preserved. So the tissue is collected and preserved and is also sent to the lab so that it is analyzed. And this is what is being done. And some of the results, what have we obtained at the moment? From the water samples, what we have been able to do so far is basically to obtain a list of species through the information, genetic information that is in the water. We have been able to analyze this. We have been able to uh, identify 5267 taxa. In January and February, there is a difference. This is something very important because in one month, we found less than in the following month, same as the genres and in each of the two months. This has taken us to notice that there are differences. There's a very intraspecific variation among the type of species from one month to the next. Also with the water samples, we were able to do sequenciations. We were able to obtain key information to determine that this so that there is enough genetic uh, information to be able to use it together with the result of the tissue results that I will explain a little to you in a minute. Also with the water samples, we were able to uh, perform an analysis of, uh, regarding the abundance and we were able to identify that in January 2020, there were certain allotypes, main types. And in February, it was able to find the same allotypes for us. What we conclude is that some species and of, of grouper are uh, appear in January and February. And however, they have differences have been found. And so we can reach the conclusion that there are other individuals that only appear in during one of the spawning months and have been found during one of the months of spawning. And this is information that will continue to appear as we continue studying the water samples. Regarding the tissue, this has helped us to prove a specific test to identify Caribbean grouper, which has been done with water samples, with a PCR specific test. And what we are trying to do is to have a, a test where if we obtain a water sample from any site, we can tell whether there is or there isn't DNA of a specific species in this site. And with, a, with time, we have been able to, we would analyze in such a way that we would be able to estimate the cells that are present and obtain the information on the abundance of this particular species so that as time passes, we would be able to come up with an alternative method of grouper 
aggregation identification. But it would be important to, the important thing is to replicate this uh, method with other species. So up to now, we have tested this, it is ready and it has been a proven uh, to see if it works and it has been determined that it is specific it will be specific for the this species and with all the water samples that we are collecting we will be able to apply this to understand the genetic um, charge in this site in a particular site before i finish i would like to mention as i said this work has not been done just by my our organization. Um, other foundations have helped with this work. Uh, fishing organizations, researchers, Alejandro is one of the researchers that concentrates on this topic. And the people that you see in this picture is the monitoring group, the community monitoring group in the area. And something that is very important Important is that I include myself here because I did not know uh, about this. Uh, and I have learned as we uh, are engage ourselves in the project. And so they have also had the opportunity to scale up this knowledge to other sites. Just as I'm as Alejandro Messens, we were able to work together in Blanquisal and we started to be part of what is being done in Chehevanvin. Blanquisal is also starting to work on collecting water samples to be able to apply these tests, to be able to analyze the quantity of information. And this opens a different panorama of focusing inspiration. And we can generate information it can cooperate to characterize in a better way the populations, both of Blanquisal and Michihavin. And this will give us the opportunity to determine how connected the different sites are. This is a very interesting data that also Alejandro mentioned that they were able to uh, register the abundance in December greater this um, uh, abundance and also in January. And with all the information that we are collecting, we could see how connected the different sites are. And uh, if the population share, if the lineages share, we don't know, but there are many questions to answer. And we hope that time and resources will allow us to reach and achieve all of these goal. So thank, I will thank the men and women of the communities, the researchers, all the foundations that are contributing to this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacobo. The next presentation, and we hope that these methodologies that we can apply them to the different sites in the Marfish site and that we can prove this connectivity and have a better management of the areas. And now I'm going to introduce Laura Carrillo. She is the oceanographic process uh, coordinator of the ECOSUR, and she will be presenting the oceanographic studies, and she will be presenting now. So I'm going to share, share right now. Can you see my screen? We cannot see it yet. I'm going to reset it. Now. Okay. 
So then, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, the geographic studies of aggregation of Blanquisal, which is in the Scala uh, Reef. This is a master's degree study. And here, let's do this a bit, uh, a shortographic context of it. We have tried to establish what the different uh, stages that occur in our, our, our Mar Reef region. So with marine, particularly the, in the, what we're interested in, the several studies that we've done that have given us more evidence of the oceanographic that has a lot to do with the or, or organizations. Uh, the, one of the works that we did with the different uh, scale is mainly that the Yucatan current that dominates at the, the, the Mesoamerican reef system and the centers of, of, the, of the Honduras, those characteristics of circulation has to do a lot to do with the Caribbean that goes through, through the, what we call the Cayman current. So within the knowledge of these characteristics of these oceanographic currents, we all use a series of, of, of number models to be able to have oceanographic uh, areas, to be able to give, see how we can, we can monitor those to, they would give us a greater idea of what is happening in, in the dispersions of these also works of uh, ECOSUR, the, uh, the university in Quintana Roo, that has particularly have two species of, of groupers that we we will able to find out where the aggreg aggregating sites are in the Mesoamerican area. And we have not, we have also found that the difference, there's a recession happening because of, we can see the capacity of retention because of the uh, of the de depending on the on the strength of the current. So we're able to take us of of a of a connectivity in the system of the of the Mar region, but we have much much to do because uh, the ag aggregate sites, as they talked about uh, earlier on, they are practically are. Uh, a very specific, the, the, the very specific metrics that are very specified are, are, uh, according to the, the, the area. So it's a, it's a starting point to find how the connectivity of the organizations, because if we can establish a, a border, I'd be able to find really where the where the area. Is. So this diagram that we talked about, we show here, is the basically the cycle of where they come up with the with the eggs, the dispersion of it of the larva, as and and, and the post larva. I see where they they. So this is. This this is the road that they they take. Uh, the several uh, things happen. The great scale of what we're talk, talking about, and the larger scale. But to, now we went to just to actually go into the coastal region itself and see what's happening on the coast. We selected uh, this area is is in the central part of the Mesoamerican reef system. It's within. The, the Shkalab National Park, and it has the it has a Cayman uh, current, and the, the Cayman 
uh, uh, current arrives there at the Yucatan Peninsula with the, the break, there's a lot of a lot of different uh, uh, tides and microtides that present a tremendous variety of a very narrow uh, upward system of, of how the so after the 40 meters uh, a depth we go into very deep areas so those are the are the lesion uh, winds that uh, that do it but those all those uh, what ha what happens also with uh, with colder uh, climates or with hurricanes so we have, must know a uh, better observation of what's happening in the in the borders of uh, of the aggregate aggregates of this area so we have to come up we uh, the, this is a this is a uh, uh, a master's degree uh study that we did what we 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 uh, perpendicular uh, coast uh, in the, in the columns of water to find out what the salinity and the temperature of the water column was in the areas of the uh, close to the coast we made several things of the of the what were they called uh derivators of lagochers this is also gave us as a of an echo uh meteorological station we also use um the the noah uh, boys of the station uh, 42 or 40 or 56 and uh giving uh uh, uh anchorings of the installations of the of the chains of the, of the of those uh, thermal areas as well so also had uh at the at the uh, temperature of the water this is to be able to know a little bit more what was happening in the in the reef lagoons uh to be able to know what's happening on the coast some of the results that we have and that we have been able to uh, publish in a in a review i don't know if you can see the bar below because it's very very small below but this is basically on this bar we wanted to do the what the the conditions are the different meters of depth of what's happening at each which is, for example that we've just gone through a cold front of 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 of, of, of what we call the northern winds and bring in the cold from the north that is the temperature of 13 and we have con conditions that are very adverse to to uh, navigation so in the northern areas we have started to work with the instruments, for example, on day 10 and day 11, we already have some results during this, this time, we had a, a window of work that we was able to liberate buoys and in the last few days at the, at the, at the, at the middle, we first started to feel the changes that it was that was happening because of the uh, of the cold front coming in so then we 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 saw that the, those very strong north winds uh ha happened uh really uh, altered things and and then there's a very strong wind and of course wave action in in the air also was was quite 2.8 meters so that's rather strong and the temperature of the of the air went below 18 degrees as you can see and we went to 16 and also the the the, the, the atmospheric pressure as well so we have to so the the boys that we were liberating in there allowed us to see this of what 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 the wind was actually producing in this area of the and the water column of the the currents of the surfaces and the and and, and of the depth that we could see 
Uh, the, the winds were from the southeast, so we know what's happening also when the winds come from the, from the north. We could not go out every day because when the weather uh, uh, was severe, the waves did not allow us to, to go out and do the research. So not all every day we could we do it. So after, after the 16th of March, we couldn't do anything more. When we see the analysis of the data of the profiles of these of the structures of the salinity and uh, temperature near the coast, we can see we can also going as we go away from the coast, we can see with the different on the 14th day, for example, we were still calm. We had uh, areas that uh, allowed us to be able to observe this. There's a, the, the, you see, we, we find exactly how the, how the salinity was on the surface water that came basically from the lagoon area. And in the deeper areas that we have very colder waters. So when there's occurrences of, of the northern winds, the conditions are totally changed. And you can see that it would be totally mixed up right now in the areas when the, when the northern winds come in. And we can also see it in the column of the sensors. They have different, at different depths. We can observe how the conditions of strata, for strata and how they break up in an area of the deep an area, they, they can also be of the same temperature or or, or the superficial areas, uh, very like one uh, and, and the other. And we also calculated the depth. We have how much of the winds are affecting the, the, the water column. So we can see that practically when the northern weed comes, the depth of, of, of being able to mix the whole column up that has that, that uh, 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 the, the power to be able to do that. So, for example, on the 15th day, we can see how from one day to another, how things can change, totally different. When we have these conditions before and after these events that we had, of the experience that we had, we have that our water column, when we com compare for the 14th day with, uh, with the, how the, the line is on the 15th, on the day 15th, it's but very, very, very mixed uh, uh, of the of the aggreg aggregates uh, sites. Uh, where we and on the seventh seventeenth, when we did a profile, so we detected is is a percent, but they're they're much, much colder and more salty area at the bottom of the of the area than we did on four, on day fourteen. When we see the analysis of the currents of the acoustic profile, what we see here at the difference in time, there are some points that neck, neck very close to the bottom that, 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 that is also transported towards the south, coinciding also with this with these more dense, uh, salty water. So in a, in a profile, uh, profile of a, B, APC, we don't know it in the, we haven't started to do it in the whole area because we had to try to recover some of the data bec because of the equipment is located on the on the launch and of acoustic uh, to be able to know what the currents are at different points of what was uh, 
what we've done actually on the bottom, we made a transect on the 15th day. As you can see here, we can see that yes, there is something that we have to take into account and analyze. Uh, but you, for example, there's variations. This also takes us to think about what's happening then in the spawning uh, site. So what we'd see then is the influence of the coastal area. So what we see, if what was happening in the, uh, in the reef lagoon, it has a real mix of, but also when it when the water comes out and the wa the coldest water during the north area, this this uh, reef lagoon has in uh, has has interchange of water with the tides. They generate a flow to, outward flow towards a continental platform to be able to have basically we see what we detecting in this area. We don't have it before, but we we didn't have it before. We have not been able to see so the before. And this gives us gives us more questions about how we can come up with a new experiment. So this is also happening with other northern winds. And there's something else that we are contemplating as it's outside. Uh, the site on the platform itself, but because, for example, we had, we basically used of uh, do it on the first forty meters of depth. With all this, we have the the following conclusions. We observed a rapid uh, response to the to the oceanographic conditions and the coast because of the of what was happening meteorologically with the cold winds coming from the from the north and as a result of the northern winds the water column was was mixed up there was a there was a difference in the direction of the currents and of course uh, the, uh, the uh, there was a tremendous uh, uh, effect of these of these winds afterwards of this intense north winds on the platform, they they now changed uh, areas and they went they went uh, uh, to an, in a in a deeper and different direction. So we can continue the studies to try to understand the synchronicity of the process of because we know the, how the 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 reproductive aggregations uh, the spawning areas actually work and how do they use uh, the the uh, the uh, how how they use the different these things so that would be all that i have to present thank you very much thank you laura excellent work and this methodology for the marfish is excellent. I want to present to you now our next panelist, Eloy Sosa, who is an, uh, an Chetumal uh, associate, and he's in Ecosur. Is the in the interview that he does with Don Mencho that it, that we know that we all appreciate very greatly. So I'm I'm ready for when you indicate. Uh, to see that okay okay first of all good afternoon to everybody i congratulate you because you have been able to continue until the last presentation and before i start to show the video i would like to share a few points of reflection with you regarding the video with don mencho and the meaning of this video and first place, I would like to uh, stress three important points for all of us who work on the coastal area. The first is the importance of the contribution of the local knowledge and what is also known as traditional ecological knowledge. It's called TEK in English and also to recognize the community knowledge 
This knowledge is very important in fishery and especially in the case of the aggregations. In the study of the aggregations, local knowledge often is the principle that takes us to identifying the traditional spawning areas because the first to discover these sites of very often are the local fishers. The map that Alejandro presented in his presentation of the relationship between the point geographical points and how they relate the, the geographically placed on the map. This map was made based on interviews to fishers and they would tell us where they have seen this and what part of the coast they have detected spawning points. And the, the, this is why I, I, I stress that the local knowledge is a contribution. The third point I would like to reflect on is the recognition to the veteran fishers, those men and also women of the coastal uh, communities who, with, through their experience, their commitments, they counsel together, and, and they also with uh, researchers, and the concern they have regarding the re natural resource survival. And uh, these uh, resources are many. We are here, and I'm going to show you the particular case of Don Mench, but there are many, many more. Fortunately, there's a whole legacy. This is part of the identification that we have to continue to do. After these three points, I quickly would like to mentioned something about Don Mencho, Don Emesio Salazar. He is a veteran fisher from Quintana Roo. And among his main achievements and his trajectory and his life, he said he is a co-partner, uh, uh, founder of the and Quintana Roo Andres Fisher um, Cooperation that was founded at the end of the 50s. In the 70s and the 80s, Domencho was the director of, and president of this, of this um, cooperative. In the 80s, he was a political delegate with authority in the population of Ishkala that depends, of, uh, depends um, on the capital of Quintana Roo. He's recognized by his, for his great knowledge on fishery. He knows a lot about navigation, knows a lot about the climate. People go to him to ask him what the weather is going to be like in the next few days. 2010, he also was a guidance, a guide for sport fishing. And he was recognized as one of the first fly fishing, fly fishers in the period. After the 90s, Don Mencho has supported an important number of different researchers from many institutions. In the case of ECOSUR, who we are talking to because of the larvae recruiting and the aggregation, behind all of this is Don Mencho. Definitely, this is the case. So having said this, having mentioned these points, I ask Ana Silvia if she can please project the video. Domencio, his contributions to fishing research. Mr. Demesio Salazar is a veteran fisher from Quintana Roo. He is the a, a, partner of the Cooperative Society of the Fishing Production. In the 70s and 80s, he had several important uh, positions, including being president of the cooperative. In the 80s, he had the, he was the, a delegate of the province of Ishkalat. He is a recognized citizen because of his many, much, his great knowledge of fishing, 
climate and navigation. During the 90s, to between 2010, 2000, 2010, he was uh, supported the researchers of Ecosur that worked in recruiting the fish larvae, contributing his great knowledge in the lagoon area. He is a very honored, very respected in the south of the state and in all of Quintana Roo. And that during the last years, because of health problems, he has not been able to participate in fishing, which has always been his passion. My name is Demencio, Nemesio Salazar Young. I am 76 years old. <coughs> how long, for how many years do you know the El Blanquizal Santa Julia uh, site? This uh, site, was sought by uh, first by a person that does not live anymore. His name was Luis Marin. Luis Marin Col with another man, Aristeo Bardales. They looked for this place. They found this place. They started fishing here. They would fish in a small boat that was very small. It was belonged to Mr. Apollonio Valencia. It was such a small boat that it could only carry um, 700 kilos of fish. And what year was fishing? Did fishing start in El Blanquizal, Santa Julia? Well, around uh, between the 70s, around the 70s, what species have been found in Blanquisal, Santa Julia? Well, there are many species. There's group, like a grouper, uh, rubia, snapper, lunar snapper, many species, many other species too. The snapper, comes in in the months of May, in the month of in the month of May. Those are the months of reproduction of the lunar part a lunar snapper. Currently, what is the state of Blanquisal Santa Julia? This site is in good conditions. It's, it has been taken care of. We have taken good care of it that um, we have made sure that sophisticated equipment has not been used there, such as netting and other things. So this is why uh, it has been taken care of very well. Do you feel that the current fishers understand the importance of the aggregations? Well, on one side, they have to value it because if not, if they don't all value it, it will finish, it will end. It will extinguish, be extinguished. But if they continue to value it, to take care of it, and to and to, to use line fishing, it will last a lot longer. Who can participate in the conservation of these fishing sites? Many people, many more people can participate. They can participate taking care of it, looking after it, because if we do not take care of it, it will finish. What advice would you give the new fishing generations? Well, my reflection is to continue with the caretaking, the, 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 how, continue con taking care of it as we always have done. Taking care is a very important, the main factor for all those aggregations. And everybody can participate, but with the proper care. So I would tell them to continue with the same regulation, to continue with the same norms and regulation. And if these aggregation will last years and years, if they're taken care of, so with participation also of the government, because the government is the main, uh, the main organization that should ensure that what we have, what nature has left us, 
uh, is taken care of. Don Mencho, as we call him, lovingly has not only supported in development of in, uh, research, but also in establishing the protected natural area in the Ishkalak reefs. His studies in the field for reproductive fish, lobster, lionfish, etc., are invaluable. We have so much, very much to thank him for. Would you like to share anything else with us, Eloy? We're still, you still have a little bit of time. I comment that the conversation with Don Mencho was a little longer. He was able to tell us some stories of Mahagual. Mahagual is the, the, the worst example for the Mexican Caribbean. It was an aggregation site that was relatively shallow, between 10 or 12 meters. And this is where the first place that Don Mencho worked at. And after the 90s, the middle of the 90s, it practically there is no aggregation because of the excess of fishing. And so the, the, the talk, uh, he shared other things with us too, and we have the commitment that we will continue to talk with him. So I would like to tell you also that in each community, in the different communities, try to find those people like Don Mencho that have so much knowledge and talk with them. And if possible, to interview them so that you can share them with us. This is a tradition, this is oral visual legacy that is worth uh, rescuing. This is what I would like to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Loy, thank all the panelists very much. We're at the end of the presentations now. And there was one question in the question session that was answered by Jacobo. And the next question is if it's possible to, to access to the recording of the presentations. Yes, we will. Please fill out the list of the contact list on the chat so we can share the presentations with you. Anyone would like to raise their hand? Can, we have a few minutes if there are any questions you would like to add to the chat of questions and answers. Yes, I will share the list with you right now. And it says, uh, hi, hello, Cecilia. Judith Morales, good morning to everybody. A question for Dr. Laura regarding measuring the ocean, oceanographic par parameters in your presentation these days that you mentioned uh, that these were done. Do you know if there were any spawning events of the, at the aggregation? Have and Has any correlation been done with those events? Yes, I forgot to mention that precisely those days were selected because they were the days that we knew that there would be a full moon and we knew there would be aggregations, that aggregations are usually in the afternoons. And we practically at that time 
we were not there to make the observation, but what was done was that uh, some, uh, my student had uh, uh, several um, eggs came out. Uh, there were no groupers, but several s species appeared. But with my uh, help from Lulu, from Lourdes Vaquez, we saw s several species of fish. And as Alejandro already mentioned, mentioned it is a multi-species site. Not only groupers aggregate, but several species. We found other um, fish type fish like parrotfish that have greater relevance. And definitely in the sites when we were making these measurements with the instruments, there were probably uh, spawning events. And that is why we want to make a design to be able to start to make a more direct correlation to see if these events through the different norths uh, through uh, during the aggregation events, which we know happened during the full moon. Thank you. I think uh, Lulu would like to make a comment. Yes, I think that Melina was uh, had her hand raised before me, but I uh, would like to remind you that Melina had another question. And yes, this, but if please answer the question first. Yes. Definitely what Laura comments was done on behalf of this Laura student that had this initiative and we did obtain uh, the uh, several eggs and that was sequenced with the barcode um, technique. But something that I would like to mention is that the oceanographic uh, cruise cruises in the Mesoamerican Caribbean in 2007 were seeking to find eggs, mainly larvae, because it's practically impossible to find or identify the, the eggs morphologically, larvae of grouper. And we were not successful, even though there were some intensive campaigns around the aggregation sites at different depths, up to 100 meters of depth in sampling, but we did not sequence fish eggs. We sought for the egg, for the larvae, but we did not find them. Not just one tiny uh, larvae of three millimeters in Belize. We did find larvae of black grouper, but the Perca Bonasi, we found some larvae, and generally this larvae are very important for us regarding species. They are very important, resist to be found easily. This is what I wanted to add. There has been a great effort made to try to find this, but we have not been successful. I comment that those two uh, trips found more than 70,000 fish larvae, and they were not all se sequenced, but it has not been an easy task. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to continue, Laura? Yes, what Lulu uh, mentioned is very interesting because why? Were they not found? This uh, called our attention. Why? Why couldn't we find? Uh, and we, I know that during these cruises, we swept the area with these, and we would, and nothing was found. And then, I think it is very important because of this to do the monitoring in the oceanic uh, um, area and um, at a much greater scale, also the coastal area, which is key for the return of the larvae. And, and uh, 
the events occur that can modify the conditions that are expected, even though it is a microwave uh, regimen, there could be the tides can affect it, the winds, but when there is a, such a drastic change uh, when it, uh, with these uh, rainy seasons, these winters, uh, I think and I wonder if there may be preference or a coincidence or synchronicity regarding using the method of, of egg spawning where the condition of the current in Yucatan is not as dominant, where there is a not so fast effect. And also if they uh, if they go to the bottom of the ocean, if these are eggs that do not have great floating ability, and if there is a mix also, and also if you have such an intense elements, there could be a flux if they go through the bottom of the ocean. Oh, there is so much to follow, to research that that is why we want to make this, conti to continue this research. It's not easy. And uh, this we are in every time we have less and less resources and we have to move with caution with the federal government and this co cooperation with NOAA, with MAR fund are very important. And this is why we have been able to obtain extra funds to be able to continue with this idea. And, and to find an extra piece of the puzzle so that we can ask the following questions so that we can uh, have better management of these sites. And uh, we all often generalize the fact that there's a lot more that's happening there and that we have to do more research. Okay, Melina, would you like to? mention. Yes, I think that in any case, my question was answered. The doctors have answered my questions and I would like to congratulate all the presenters today. It was very interesting, very, very interesting and exciting too. And thinking about putting all this information together, we could think of making a type of model that could help us uh, after, not so, only with the connectivity of the MAR, but we're doing more for identifying probable possible ag uh, aggregation sites that, as we mentioned, there are sites that are known by the community of the local fishing uh, communities, but unfortunately they have disappeared, etc maybe putting all these all this data together we could maybe extrapolate or identify new areas that maybe we did not know about or we can find out about i'm going to answer that i think that yes we could try at least to find preferential sites, aggregation sites have many particularities that require this observation. These are sites where that with the connection with the oceanic part is very, uh, there are processes of exchange that are very fast, we could say. These are sites where somehow there are structures of reefs where also we can produce locally of retention, etc. There's a lot to do. Yes, the idea is not just to obtain a model, but we can also find potential sites. We don't know if there's going to be migration with these climate change situations. And I think it would be worth starting, beginning to look for, come up with these models. 
So we are still uh, very far. I don't think that even though I can't say we have really advanced so much, we're just beginning to uh, make progress. Good, oh, thank you very much, Laura. I will also read the questions that uh, that have, uh, have sent over the chat. We have Luis Alfonso Reyes Balbuena. I ask you, how about uh, when, how do they disappear? So Eloy is answering that. So I don't know if Eloy, you can answer that question. In the case of Mahagual, there it was very clear it's an ag aggregate site that is not very deep. It's very accessible to fisher, fishermen and fishers. Where Menjo started to, started to fish in Mahagual, there, there was salt type fish. They, 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 they did not use a, a spear. But the Mahagual afterwards starts to to uh, to have a tremendous uh, amount of grouper. It was a there's registers in 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 uh, that uh, in December there's 22 tons of Mahagual. So there there was a tremendous fish. How, 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 how the, that's not very deep. So, because I have the mic to have to like to comment to many of these areas of, of Quintana Roo are on the coast. There are, we are very clear waters that the people, fishers can see actually, but I'd like to put on the table the difficulty of, of the, the, the peninsula of Yucatan uh, and Honduras and Nicaragua that have tremendously large platforms there the aggregate sites can be very far away from the coasts and there's very little people that can see it so the detection of those aggregate sites can be of they would have to have different type of tools to be able to do so they could be a tremendous uh, aggregate sites on the border of the platform or theirs on on uh, distant reefs so we don't we cannot identify based upon what uh, fishers say so we have to see how we can identify that thank you there's another question so the 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 impact for fish fishing is there another way of be able to protect, protect uh, aggregate areas. Is somebody would like to respond to this question of how to protect aggregate sites? Felipe, go right ahead. There is, no, there's a new recipe. Well, we have to record these way of doing it is as in the past, but you try to control the fishing. Uh, Belisa has has uh, uh, be able to to Belisa has had be able to, to do it to close it to 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 fishing rights. That could be a strategy, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult to do so. There's innumerable commercial species that are captured particularly when they when they have their reproductive cycles because they're they're together it's more efficient to fish there when they're all aggregated to to be able to fish it as a redundancy so those fish that are that are that are, that are there's much less cost for it. So in the, in the case of aggregates, we can control the fishing in to be able to have agreements with the communities so that, so that you can protect those aggregates, which are the, are the, the these, those fish are, are always being fished. So particular, particularly if we can do so, of the in the aggregate area so i think alexandra i think can add to that thank you thank you 
Alejandro, can you uh, add to what's that? I think Alexandra's already uh, signed off. There, here it is. Alejandra, are you right? There's, we don't have another question. My recommendation to this question, as you can see in our policy regarding a document that I shared with you, we have recommendations for fall protection of aggregate sites and that we can share with you to be able to see this document that we developed with Ida and Kovi. You can see the recommendations that are done for the management and protection of these aggregate sites. So therefore, Alejandro is already good. So if there's no other question then, we are, please, please uh, put up your, your, your screen. Jacob was right there. Thank you, Jacobo, just to to, uh, agri uh, to add what Dr. Eloy said. So many of the measures have already be able to do so at this, because of the types that something be very effective that we have to all, always consider the, the opinion of the sector, not only their opinion, but also involve them in the whole process of designing and particularly the, the management of this, so we could design some good tools and establish them. But, but if they did not given uh, continuity in, in the management, the results can be, can be not what we expect. So the, my recommendation is that that not talk about new, uh, uh, but 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 to but to involve the main actors, which are the fishers themselves, to be able to come up. Then we we can be successful with the, with these initiatives. Very good. Thank you very much of all the panel panelists and. We are finishing this webinar and we're going to take a register of this. Gracias. Nos vemos. Eh, les los invito a visitar el, eh, nuestra página de web, encontrar los documentos eh, y también de HRI, de nuestros socios, para que puedan encontrar sus publicaciones. Nos vemos. Muchas gracias por participar. Gracias. Saludos. Saludos a todos. Saludos. Bonita tarde. Hasta luego. Vale.